Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, episode number 12. Dart, take it away, Jason. Hey guys, so we uh, had a little bit of a hiatus. Um, I was kind of doing a whole lot of traveling, wasn't in uh, my residency very uh, frequently, and Patrick was uh, is a new father. So oh no. Congratulations. <laughs> who, who decided that was acceptable? <laughs> <laughs> so people did not get a vote on that i promise you <laughs> he didn't get upvoted no <laughs> oh <No>. tear <laughs> um but yeah so it it uh babies have sort of been uh like a recurring thing you know like it's like one person has a baby and a lot of our friends are having like uh, my wife and I, a lot of our mutual friends are having babies now and so it made me think about kids and one of the things that I think a lot about kids is I think about the, you know, how they relate to the internet and to tech and things like that. You should think about diapers. Yeah, well, I just... Many diapers. I told, you know, Lindsay that, like, we could just adopt a 12-year-old and get to, like, the cool part, you know, where they're, where they're into tech and computers. Have you met many 12-year-olds? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that's not such a good idea. But, uh, yeah. So, you know, I was thinking, like, when we were kids, we... You know, our parents, well, maybe your parents were more savvy than mine, but my parents didn't understand anything about computers or the Internet. Um, you know, my dad, he thought the computer was like an extension of the sewing machine, you know, <laughs> using the mouse with his foot and everything. It didn't make any sense. That is awesome. <laughs> so we sort of had complete freedom on the Internet. Like, and, you know, you could argue that maybe it made us more responsible. Maybe it made us like more like adventurous, you know, it was really the Internet was kind of like the wild, wild west. And we could, you know, have access to anything. Um, and now, you know, the Internet's become so big and there's 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 so much content on there. And also there's it's so uh, more accessible that you have to wonder, like for kids who are growing up nowadays, like should you censor their Internet um, or should you sort of give them the same free reign we had? Yeah, it, it is interesting. We actually had some friends of ours who have a one-year-old over, and the one-year-old was able to get on the phone and bring up YouTube and find Sesame Street videos <laughs> and watch them on YouTube. It's and insane. I looked at the parents that you realize there's other stuff on YouTube as well, right? And <laughs> so, um, and I guess that's only a relatively dangerous place to go on the internet. But uh, I mean, yeah, it is an interesting question. So a lot of People do inst try to install these nanny software or filter software and block certain certain sites. And the issue I have with those is that they don't really work. And then when the kids get older, and if they haven't learned what's acceptable and what's not, they just figure out ways around it. And yeah. uh, so this is not particularly effective. What I think is effective, I think, is uh, educating yourself. So we have an advantage of, you know, we already kind of know about computers, so we understand these things. And, you know, tell your kid that, look, you know, I need to be able to have access to your accounts. Now, you don't ever use that, and you hopefully you never have to, but you need to share with them that, like, look, this is important. I need to be able to know what you're doing. And it's for their safety just yeah. like you wouldn't allow them to go with people you didn't know to the park or whatever and i think it's important for them to trust you to not constantly be reading everything but they need to know that you can if they if something happens and that they need to know that that's the kind of thing that they need to be thinking about so i think that's one way and another way is also to have the computer in an area or have the usage pattern set up such that as especially when they're really young that the usage is very very limited right so that you only use the computer when they're there with you you know that kind of or, sorry they only use the computer when you're there with them. <laughs> Other way around, like, yeah, okay. Anyways. Bring your daughter to work every yeah. day. <laughs> oh, no, 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 that would be hard. But, uh, you know, so that you're watching them and, and helping teach them good habits, you know, just like the state requires you to have a parent or some adult who's a hopefully responsible around when you're learning to drive, you know, same kind of thing. As they're learning, they need to have yeah. somebody responsible around so they can learn good habits and, yeah. you know, what's the right way to do things. And then even as they continue to grow up and gain independence, still to have it somewhere where they know somebody will, you know, be around and, and pay attention to what they're doing. And that, you know, show an interest in, in caring about what they post online and, you know, sharing with them the danger about. I, I think it's even different than when we were growing up because when we were growing up, it's still mostly consumer oriented. So you would go on the internet and consume things you know you would read things you would you know go to stuff and that was a concern is you would view something that was damaging to you or that your parents didn't want you to view um, versus the relatively controlled media of like a tv or cds or dvds or whatever that they would kind of know about um mm -hmm. but i think the the extra danger that faces children today that is newer is 
this uh, ability for phones and computers and everything to take video and then post that online or, or pictures as well. Yep. And I see that a lot. That's very dangerous because then the problem isn't you get damaged, you know, and then nobody kind of knows about it except you and maybe your parents or whatever, but that you could actually post something that's damaging to you and your family, you know, for everybody to see. And then the way the internet works, that's really hard to remove references to that, you know, yeah, and if, if it's even possible. And so I think that is a far more dangerous thing is people having YouTube accounts where they allow children to upload to YouTube or, you know, even having a Facebook account, reading other people's Facebook statuses can be damaging enough, but allowing your children to post pictures and stuff to Facebook for others to view, that's, I, I mean... How, that's a very hard thing to control. I would struggle with not what I allow my kids to watch or view or read, but what I allow them to post. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I think you're totally right on the nanny software. I have a coworker who's in sort of this arms race with his kids where, you know, he... Uh, he blocks YouTube, and then they had some other website, which is basically a mirror of YouTube, um, and they just use that to get around it, and then he blocks that, and they, they have this whole back and forth, and it really doesn't get the message across, which is that you want, ultimately what you want is for your kids to be responsible, and you know, setting up setting up a block and getting your kids to like spend a lot of their time figuring out how to break the system, like, I don't know, might, might make your kid a great white hat hacker or something <laughs> like that, but it's not really getting the message. But I think that, that you're totally right that you should try to, you know, in the beginning, walk your kids through the internet and sort of, you know, hold their hand, you know, as they get through it. And then uh, later on, sort of, I always feel like maybe what I would do is kind of spot check, you know, like if if, if, if things are going okay and if, if I there hasn't been anything weird or if I jump into my kids' emails and, you know, they're, uh, there's nothing like weird or anything like that, then, uh, you know, you just give them the freedom to do whatever they want. But uh, then if they start getting into things which could be damaging, because ultimately you're responsible. I mean, if they are part of some group that, you know, that hacks into, I don't know, some kind of like power plant or something like that. Like as a parent, you'll be responsible for that. And I think it's a judge when you're checking to say, is this something minor or is this something major? You know, because it's something yeah. minor, you know, and it's like, it's like the kid who's playing a little rough and you, you know, your parents were like fussed when you, you and your siblings were playing like, hey, somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to get hurt. But they didn't always stop you. And then yeah. somebody would get hurt and they were right. And you learned your lesson, you know, and that's yeah. kind of the way it worked. Versus if you're doing like, you know, juggling torches you know they probably would have stopped you like hey don't juggle torches you're gonna you know massively burn yourself so i mean i think that's the thing too is like noticing them doing something that's a little bad versus like something that could cause you know major harm yep yeah definitely so. it, it's got to be a case-by-case -case basis so i know growing up i uh was pretty responsible on the internet like pretty well responsible but so my parents kind of let me have free reign even you know as technology grew and they understood more about the internet they, they never really had a problem with that but then like conversely it's really bad about doing chores especially like leaving the laundry <laughs> I, i'd leave the laundry in the washing machine like just just sitting like wet laundry uh, in the washing machine for like a day and then th those uh, clothes are like virtually ruined like you have to rewash them first you have to like let them air dry then you have to rewash them and so so my parents are always on top of me like all of our the listeners laundry? Are, the laundry? are very excited about this they did not know they were going to tune in and learn about <laughs> the proper way to fix forgotten laundry in the washer <laughs> And so it's it's kind of the same way with your kids, right? Like if they, uh, you know, this is just another dimension upon which you have to like sort of monitor your kids' behavior and stuff like that. I agree. So. I, and I think it's as hard as it is. I, I guess it's difficult for me. I don't really relate. But people who are parents who aren't, well, I guess they're not listening to our podcast. But parents, for those parents who we all know who aren't as technical savvy, I mean, I think as technical people, you have to help give good advice to those yeah, parents totally. because they really don't know and there's a lot of people who really don't know anything about computers and yep. you know you kind of got to give good advice to those people and, and help them to know what the right thing is. yeah definitely all so, right well news yeah yeah so it's been a while but we'll try to keep news to relatively new news so <laughs> yeah, right. so there's this thing you, you keep seeing it around the internet at first i thought it was a dessert raspberry pie <laughs> then i realized pie was spelled like the greek letter and it turns out it's a embedded computer device that looks pretty cool um a group of people got together and said you know that they want to make a embedded computer that's going to be 35 dollars that runs linux and see what people do with it similar to we talked about on the show before the Arduino and other such devices and uh, I heard you had you had found this already independently right you had been been looking at these and you, you even have your name on the wait list yeah yeah definitely I'm on the wait list to grab a Raspberry Pi 
It's relatively small. It's uh, embedded. So for people who aren't too familiar with embedded um, device, basically what that means is it's an entire computer on a single uh, wafer. So on a single like sheet. Board. Yeah, a single board. <clears throat> so I'm trying to pull up the specs on how big it is. I think it's like about twice the size of a credit card. So like that about, about right. two credit cards, you can imagine like squarish, like stacked square wise. And so it uh, has many different things on it. So it has, you know, obviously a processor. It has an SD card. So uh, you can pop an SD card, even a 32 gig SD card for storage. Um, there's a 25, there's a $35, which is $10 more than the base base $25 model that has an Ethernet port on it. But uh, other than that, it still uh, has USB, has HDMI out. I think it even has RCA out and stereo yes. out. So um, you can imagine you're plugging one of these to your, into your television. Um, you could, uh, it has a GPIO for uh, people who aren't familiar with that. That's basically a way to... General purpose input and output? Yep, that's right. It's basically a way to talk to different things. If you have, excuse me, if you have little motors, so you want to make, say, a robot car or something like that, you could totally use a GPIO um, interface to talk to those stepper motors or talk to those um, you know, brushless motors if you're making an airplane or whatever. So um, you can do all sorts of really fun stuff with it. Uh, do you have any ideas of what you would do uh, if you got these one? These are so uh, – there's so many cool things. And uh, actually with the baby, you know, you start thinking of uh, – you know, you see stuff in the store and like, I can make something that does the same thing. Or, <laughs> you know, real, feeding the baby takes a long time, you know. So like if you give the baby a bottle or whatever and they drink it, but it takes a long time. They're not good at holding it themselves. I think I really should design something to hold this so that, you know, I can go do other stuff and uh, basically try to be as lazy as possible. Um, <laughs> nice. But, yeah, so constantly I'm thinking of things like that. But uh, I, I think that having an HDMI – is really useful that's something that it's traditionally very you know and also rca video but just having video output built in and so cheap has a lot of things because we've talked about before it's very uh rewarding to program something and see it in video and pictures and that's why i think part of what game programming is so um such a thing that people get introduced to programming through and uh the thing the this board being so cheap and having that video capability is very intriguing and what can you display onto a tv because everybody has tvs and it's understandable and your friends you know if you show a little motor that spins around it's like okay or well look i blinked this led in morse code okay <laughs> like that nobody cares but if you like put something up on the tv then like people are like wow this is awesome like how did you do this yep. so that's really intriguing to me yeah definitely i mean i'm I personally the first thing i'm going to do on it is get mame uh you know multiple arcade machine emulator compiled on it i have no idea why i want to do that it already runs on my phone and so, like can it run doom everything it's not else. a proper computer until it runs doom yeah that's right that's right so I uh, get a bunch of those stuff on it, uh, but I think long term what I'd really want to do with it is um, either some kind of like social uh, kind of like communication thing. So maybe you have a bunch of people at a party or something, you could have this as like a centerpiece and talk to it from your phones or something like that. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. And there's definitely make a robot that can fit you drinks from the refrigerator or something like that. So You and thousands of nerds before you have attempted such an endeavor. <laughs> Will you be the first to completely succeed? <laughs> Yeah, it takes power. I don't know if uh, it doesn't have a battery per se, but I'm sure people will add a module for that. It also um, it doesn't have any type of Wi-Fi like Bluetooth or um, you know or, or wireless, but um, it does have a USB port. And already some people are mass producing like really tiny little Wi-Fi nubs that plug into the USB port and add a little bit to the yes. profile, yes. but and gives Bluetooth you Wi-Fi. ones as well, similarly yep. small. That's right. And I yeah. think they're looking at making a new version, like a Model C or something, which will have Wi-Fi. So, the, so look out for that in the future. All right, could be cool. Something yeah. to keep your eye on. And uh, the so the article that, that brought this up for the news is not only is this cool, but they've had issues again. Um, we never really talked about it here, but a lot of hardware manufacturers have this. When you, It's very difficult to actually build something, unlike software, which you just kind of release it and it's still very hard to get rid of all the bugs but with hardware not only do you have the issue with the bugs but sourcing the parts getting the parts installed correctly making sure you have the right parts somebody could send you a batch you know i was reading the other day about somebody who's trying to make a hardware kit and they got wrong leds and they were it happened they were counterfeit leds oh, and man. you know causes all sorts of implications so they were going through some troubles with having wrong ethernet port parts so yeah yeah i saw that they didn't have i guess proper shielding on the ethernet but supposedly it's been fixed now so so that's good news. And I, I honestly think that, you know, save yourself the $10 and buy the one that doesn't have Ethernet and put a Wi-Fi 
the yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. Ethernet especially is, if you so... wait a little bit and see if which which Wi-Fi is the best supported one. Yeah, and that's then true. buy that Wi-Fi. D- there actually, if you go to the FAQ, there's a section on Wi-Fi, and uh, it has a list of like ones they recommend. Nice. That that's a really important point. Um, so I've done a lot of this kind of stuff before. I've used gum sticks. Patrick's done a lot with Arduino, and you know, a lot of these embedded operating systems they don't support you know a wide range of hardware. So you might go to Best Buy, let's say, and buy USB Wi-Fi. And it just won't work. And it's because so much on the software level um, just hasn't been implemented for this OS. Well, and often it's proprietary. So yeah. whoever makes that particular stick D-Link or whatever won't release a Linux driver for it. Yeah. Or will release it in such a way that it's very hard to get that to work on other platforms or other devices. Yeah. So keep in mind that embedded devices run what's called ARM. Most of them run ARM. And uh, long story short is ARM is just a different type of processor than what you have on your desktop. So the instructions are different. Um, For example, like if you want to move data from one register to another, just the way to describe that action in ARM is different. And uh, the set of instructions is different. So because of that, you know, even if you have some USB, you know, Wi-Fi adapter that works in Ubuntu, um, you know, on your desktop, doesn't necessarily mean that it'll work on these embedded systems for that reason. So. And talk about confusing consumers. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so embedded systems require a little bit of you know thinking beforehand. But the nice thing, the whole goal of this Raspberry Pi is that up until now, even Arduino was close to a hundred dollars, right? Uh, no, so you can get ones that are fairly cheap. Yeah. Oh, okay. The thing okay. is that they don't have, they're not accomplishing the same kind of task, and they've gotcha. been around for a lot longer. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, because I know the gum sticks, which is similar spec to this was close to $600. Um, so, you know, this being $35, it, it opens uh, it opens this technology up to a whole new audience. And so I think that people will be much more educated about embedded systems moving forward. Yeah, and it's definitely a useful skill talking about, you know, people interested in skills that transfer to the real world. I mean, there are many, 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 many companies out there doing stuff with embedded computing platforms, systems, and learning how to program in a limited resource environment that yeah. the systems represent is a very transferable skill. Yeah, definitely. So, talking about making a robot. Yeah, so um, we're going to talk now about uh, California being the second state to allow autonomous cars. So, this what was the first one? So, the first state was Nevada. Okay. Yeah, they passed the bill a few months ago. It wasn't that long ago. Um, up until then, they uh, people had been sort of testing autonomous cars in very controlled environments. Um, then Nevada passed the law not too long ago saying that uh, as long as somebody's in the car... You can um, you can uh, have a machine or have a computer driving the car, but there had to be a person there to sort of supervise and take control. Yeah, so I you know I thought a lot about this uh, in addition to censorship for kids. Um, no, <laughs> so I, I think about autonomous cars because I really want one yep. every day when I commute to work. I, I think I want that autonomous car. Where is it? When's yep. it coming? The other the other week we drove to L.A., which is we both don't know. The drive from Northern California to L.A. is about what six hours, uh, seven yeah. hours, something like that so um it's uh, it's a long drive and the whole time i was thinking god if i had an autonomous car like all four of the seats could just face the middle and we could be playing agricola or power grid right Ooh, now like we, board games yeah we could totally be board gaming for seven hours this is like this is time that's yeah, just so valuable last time yeah so so i think about this and it i just it's going to be one of those things that i think is going to even once the technology enables it it's still not going to be here and it's just going to be one of those things that's kind of because it's going to be so hard who do you blame when an accident happens you know mm-hmm. the officer shows up and who does he write the ticket to you know who do the ins- what do the insurance companies do you know how do they price that in to insure cars that are autonomous um you know all these situations are even uh the i know there was one case where an autonomous car was driving and got rear-ended well i, I don't think the autonomy was on at the time but even if it did like what happens if it's not even the fault of the autonomous car the yeah. first thing that's going to happen is despite how much does engineers it doesn't make sense the first time somebody rear ends a car that's autonomous and it was 100 percent their fault but they have a really good lawyer that lawyer is going to bring a lawsuit against the other person saying that they want all the source code for the autonomous car they want it reviewed they they think it's his fault that it applied the brakes too suddenly faster than what a human could have or yeah. any of these things and basically in a fight to try to get overturned and then it's going to cause get caught up in a legal quagmire for the foreseeable future yeah the thing i'm worried about too is or, or just interested i guess more is a better word uh, is uh, are people going to be able to game the autonomous car so let's say half the cars on the road are autonomous and you need to get to work 
and you're really in a hurry, like you're late for work. If you turn off the autonomous mode, can you like somehow game the AI that's driving the other cars? So if you get... flash your lights three times and you yeah, wiggle your car, yeah. it thinks you're drunk and so it gets out of the way. Yeah, exactly. And you can just speed past it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think there's almost going to be an arms race between the people who have auton- between the autonomous cars and the uh, human drivers who want to get past them. Well, I think early the, you know, like high occupancy lanes and stuff like this will be enabled for autonomous cars because they can drive so much closer. And so they'll be able to say, like, this is an autonomous car and they'll have special designated lanes for them uh, um, or share them so that it's different uh, yeah, because that, that is going to be the most difficult time. If we switch completely to an infrastructure that supported autonomous cars and there were only autonomous cars on the road, it would be very simple, actually. Or oh, yeah, when totally. you get onto a freeway, it's required that you have autonomy enabled and you're not, able to, uh, you're not allowed to disable it while you're on the freeway. It would be very easy. Yeah, but definitely. between now and then, what do you do? Like, you're going to have, in the beginning, you know, very few cars which are autonomous, then slowly more and more and more. And through each of these phases, autonomous cars have to behave differently. Yep. Yeah, so. definitely. I it just, I think that, you know, in some senses, though, I think that... Um, I, I just wonder if people will be more or less stressed because, the you know, they'll be stressed because they could go faster if they were driving it themselves. Part of the whole thing about the autonomous car is that it'll probably do close to the speed limit. I mean, I'm sure the autonomous... The well, but that AI speed limit won't. in theory will go up because it, it doesn't even make sense anymore. Yeah, Because the car true. will just know what the safest speed it can drive at based on everything. I wonder if, you, if you'll if you be able to customize it. I wonder if there'll be autonomous so hack car it? hackers. Yeah. So, I mean, in the state of California, for those of you who don't know, they actually have a thing. So if you want to get your car basically, you know, registered to drive, they inspect it and they look for, you know, modifications that aren't approved that yep. make it emit too much pollution. They test it to see how much pollution it emits, all these kind of things. There will be a check, you know, checksum on your, uh, you know, autonomous software. And if the checksum for your software doesn't check out they know you modified it and they're gonna you know write you a ticket yep or so something like that so uh you know also i recommend you get yourself on the raspberry pi waiting list as i'm on so that you can write your autonomous car hacker when both of these things are made available <laughs> and if you want to learn how to write an autonomous car i have another news link for you uh stanford is uh, just starting to roll out some new online courses so l- last semester quarter i, I you know I, don't, I guess last year at some point mm-hmm. stanford did the first uh, of these which was machine learning and I think they had another one as well and it's by a really reputable um, I'm, I'm going to mess up the name Andrew Ning is, is Andrew that Ng. Ng okay yeah there's uh, like a I guess a hidden eye not a silent eye but the opposite there's a so, hidden so eye so it's Andrew Ng yeah. and uh, he is a professor at Stanford and yep. he taught this machine learning class to the internet for free and it's structured very much like a class um, that you would take at a college you know with exams and everything but it's all automated and tests and uh, a schedule for you to go through and forums for you to talk on and you get a certificate upon completion oh okay so i I started in it and then i got busy and didn't end up finishing it (laughs) and so i actually don't know what happened but this year they're rolling out a lot more of those courses so i'm here on the list and some of them include the machine learning one again software as a service this is a buzzword starting to lose some of its uh, shine but still important natural Mm -hmm. language processing so getting computers to work with you know spoken and the written word cryptography design and analysis of algorithms computer vision i mean these are the kinds of things nerds really like i mean sorry (laughs) we really (laughs) like uh and then they have a few more which are getting ready to come out that you know are going to be out this year um probabilistic graphical models so this is how xbox's true skill works on a system similar to this game theory human computer interaction computer Computer Science 101. Maybe we should have all the parents who allow their kids on the internet to take Computer Science 101. Maybe that'll, <laughs> no, okay, that's a bad idea. Uh, information theory and anatomy. Really? Anatomy? Ana- anatomy. anatomy. And I don't think com- it's anatomy of a computer. I was going to say, <laughs> is it like von Neumann anatomy? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, computer security and making green buildings. Really? So okay. they're starting to branch out, but most of these are still applicable to uh, computer people. And so I would recommend if you are not a um person who's enrolled in college or graduated with a computer science degree or not already a programmer and you want to start learning some of those things and getting involved this is an excellent completely free resource for you to use and i think so we've had discussions about this at work about 
um, you know, having a child and what is the university system going to be like when our children, you know, become college age? Will colleges as they stand today exist? Will it be completely online? Will it be a hybrid? What will happen? It's getting so expensive to go to college now. Yep. I don't think it's sustainable that something is going to change. Something will break. And what's it going to be like? And what does that mean for putting away money? So it's so big today because college is so expensive for parents to put away money for their kids to go to college. And if college is going to be completely different in, you know, 18 years, what does that mean? How do you plan for that? What should you teach your children now about learning online so that they can be prepared to be in classrooms where there's no physical teacher? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I know it took several of my courses on, I think uh, UCF called it feeds, but I'm sure there's something similar at UF where you, you take the course online and um, there's essentially cameras set up in the classroom and things like that, but then you showed up for the exams. So that was starting to approach, you know, totally online. But now I know several courses at many universities are done completely online. It's a different skill set, though, because yeah. there's no... When you have class, there's some, even if you go, depending on your college and what class and your major and your professor's uh, niceness or not, you know, there's some amount of peer pressure and obligation to show up to class and listen to them talk when they're talking. And that keeps you on schedule. If it's on video, you can always just watch it tomorrow. Yep. But if you keep just, I'm going to watch it tomorrow, you never watch it. And then what happens when you have to show up and take the test? And, you know, there's a level of self-motivation that you have to enforce on yourself there. Yeah, that definitely. Our online courses, at university I remember even though they were online and the videos were available people still would go watch the recording of the video go watch the teacher be recorded doing it because that was the only way they could make sure that they would learn the material and do well in the test yeah definitely I can say with the from experience that the machine learning course is awesome I mean I took it kind of as a refresher um, with uh, some of my coworkers, and um, it was extremely useful and the cool thing especially about this particular course is that it um, covers a lot of um, like applied machine learning. So, you know, the guy doesn't go into a whole lot of uh, theory. I mean, there's some of it, you know, what you'd expect from an academic course, but it's a lot of sort of hands-on, very specific examples. Um, and uh, they actually talk about how to do like image search, for example, is one of the things they cover in the course. And so uh, they do like, I think they do Google News. So Andrew Ng actually works for Google. And so uh, he brings up a lot of uh, examples from things that he's done in his career. So uh, if you ever wonder how some of those things work, uh, you know, behind the scenes, uh, you can take this course and, and get it straight from the horse's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that almost should have been our tool of the week, sort of. That's an awesome recommendation for people. Very yeah, powerful. that's a killer tool. It's almost and too good to be. We'll, a tool one day of we'll the tell week. our kids. I remember when. <laughs> yeah, back in my day. Back in my day, the first course came out. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> so that'll be interesting. So speaking of tools, uh, do you have? Oh wait, the tools of the bye week. Yeah, Although it's, it's a, not really been bye week any longer. <laughs> I can't really say that. It's a tool of the bye month. Tool of the semi halfway through the year. <laughs> So, so what is your what is your tool recommendation for this this recording? Yeah, so this is um this is a problem that almost everybody has. You know, uh, is is a disk space, right? When I bought, whenever I buy a computer, I always buy you know the lowest processor to let me buy and the lowest memory, and it's just it just doesn't seem to make sense ever to spend twice as much for a better processor when you know it's going to be out of date. But I always buy the most hard drive space I can, and, you know, especially you know with a laptop. But even with desktops, I fill it full of hard disks, and I always invariably seem to run out of space. Um, so, so this is interesting because I actually do the opposite. So I tend to be more willing to spend for a processor or RAM, things which are, in my opinion, more difficult to replace on a laptop or even on a desktop of some uh, sort, and then buy a, a smallest hard drive, knowing that I'll fill it up and replace it no matter what size I put in. And then as soon as I fill up, I can just go buy it online much cheaper than their upgrade price. I can buy a new hard drive to plug it in and take the old hard drive and make it external. That works for desktops, right? No, that works for laptops as well. Really? Yeah. <laughs> uh -oh. Wait, how do you swap the hard drive on? Oh, I guess maybe... I don't think you can swap the hard drive on this, can you? Oh, on a MacBook? Oh, uh, uh, I don't know. You have to look online. I'm sure there's a way. Yeah, there's probably some way. So, But most computers, it's fairly straightforward to swap the, the hard drive. Yeah, yeah. But continue, fair. sorry. <laughs> I still fill the hard drives up no matter what. <laughs> Even more quickly because I buy the cheap one. <laughs> yeah, so uh, basically... 
uh, these are a set of three tools, depending on which OS you use, Windows, uh, Linux, or OS X, which will tell you, you know, in each directory what um, what disks you're using. So, and more specifically, what it does it gives you these really cool visualizations. So. For example, you could say, oh, your programming directory is like 70% of your hard drive. But then you can drill down and it'll sort everything for you. So you can say like, what in my programming directory is so big? And then you see, oh, my programming slash art directory is huge. It has all these art assets. And then drill down there and say, oh, you know, half these art assets are for things I don't use anymore. Let me put these like, let me like zip these and put them on a DVD so I don't have to keep them on my hard drive, right? So, um... So for Windows, it's called Winderstat, and um, if you take a look at that, it gives you, it's pretty cool when you run it, it, get, it has like these little Pac-Mans. So it starts off with just one Pac-Man, and it has like C colon, right? Or maybe it has a Pac-Man for every hard drive. But then it says, oh, C has these four directories in it. It has Windows, programming, whatever, uh, you know, da, uh, users, whatever it has. And it'll create like like four Pac-Mans that go and scan those directories. Next thing you know, there's like hundreds of these little Pac-Man <laughs> symbols. It's kind of cool. Recursively scanning your entire hard drive. So yeah, it does totally. take a while to run initially, but then yeah. after that, the drilling down and exploration goes fairly quickly. Yeah, that's right. So the idea here is, you know, you kick this thing off, and this is true for all three of the programs. You kick it off, you come back like the next day or in the morning, <laughs> you know, and then it gives you all these cool visualizations. Then you go through and start deleting stuff. And it's smart about, you know, if I delete a folder, it's it goes back and refigures out all the percents and redoes the graph without spending a lot of time there. So Winderstat. Yeah, Winderstat. Uh, look on the show notes because it's it's a little bit complicated to. Yeah, yeah, it's all one word. It's kind of weird, but uh, you, it, the show notes has a link. So. And that's Windows. Yeah, that's right. On Linux, it's uh, Disk Usage Analyzer. And there's no link for this because it comes built in with Ubuntu. But uh, pretty sure if you run you know, Slackware or Debian or any of these um, you know, uh, distributions, that you'll have some type of Disk Usage Analyzer uh, variant on there. Um, then for OS X, I use Disk Inventory X. And so this one's a little bit different. It gives you... It gives you this like sort of like weird quad tree kind of thing where everything's split into cells, but the visualization is not as good as Winderstat, but um, but it does a similar thing. So. Awesome, very yeah. useful, very useful. So uh, talking about how much, how effective and productive I am at getting work done, my tool of this week is a game, <laughs> a free game, not open source, but free, Spelunky. And Spelunky is interesting, and I, I've only played it a little bit, and Jason got so excited when he saw this that this was going to be my... <laughs> yeah. he, I think he is more excited about this being a tool of the week this than I am. Is amazing. So he's actually played this more. So the idea is you are a... Uh, we're going to get in trouble for saying this. Indiana Jones-like character. Yeah. Uh, so a cave adventurer, Spelunky, referencing Spelunking, the yep. act of going down into caves, I assume. Such a clever play on words these nerds are. Yeah, um, so unless you're talking about urban Spelunking, which is uh, going into like places in Detroit and other like you know urban abandoned areas. Okay, I didn't, I didn't know about this phenomenon. Yeah, okay. that's pretty wild. But but yeah, regular <laughs> splunking is what's going on here. In this so game. your cave explorer uh, explores randomly generated levels. So the game randomly generates you a level, and then you play through it, trying to accomplish the goal of uh, rescuing the princess. It, I, I don't know the, the girl, and some of them that's the goal, the beginning ones. I think so. And the later ones, I, I maybe it can change. But uh, so even though there's the goal of getting through this randomly generated level you don't just play on forever they actually establish a uh, meta game outside of the individual level that you play and the goal there is that you can continue to accomplish things in each level and then you can move on through this meta game and it actually does have a conclusion jason informed me of spoiler alert <laughs> yeah so splunky is kind of fun it's a it's a evolution of like NetHack and Rogue and all these games which had, you know, and Diablo in a sense, which had randomly generated levels. But um, the cool thing that Splunky adds is this mechanic where, you know, it's really hard to go through the whole game without dying because you have one life and you only have, what, two or three hits? I think it's two hits and then you die. So imagine like Mario, but with one life, right? So it's very hard to make it all the way to like Bowser's castle, right? In one shot. <laughs> so, but what the game does to sort of keep you into it is it takes all the points that you've accumulated, you know, in your very short lifespan and it, it puts it away. It puts it like in a vault and you just, these points are accumulated, every, you know, every time you play, it's just cumulative. 
So eventually you get enough points where it says, okay, Patrick, you don't have to play level one anymore. Like, we're going to start you off at level two. Success! <laughs> yeah. So it's like you have, like, the, the, the short-term game of let's see how far I can get. You know, because if you're super amazing, you could beat the game in one shot. There's nothing stopping you from going right through all 16 levels. But there's also this meta game of, you know, get as many points you can each time you play, and then eventually you'll start off, you know, meeting the boss right away. So definitely game, check out free, waste some time. I, I think it's only support on Windows. They're I, working on it looks like a game for Xbox Live. Yeah, it looks like someone's made a Mac port. Oh, okay. Yeah, awesome. I just Googled Splunky OS X, and uh, there is a Mac port. I don't know if it works or not. Your mileage may vary. But. <laughs> <laughs> the disclaimer here, we have no idea. Yeah. So and maybe on uh, we go to the standby of Run It and Wine on uh, Linux. Yeah, definitely. So uh, hopefully that will work for you. Yeah, um, Wine's gotten really, really you know, uh, much better. But definitely check out SpelunkyWorld.com, and that will be in the show notes as well. Yep. So I think the time has come, Jason. We are at the discussion of the programming language of the week, Dart. Yes, Dart. If you Google Dart, you will not find the programming language. <laughs> oh, no. You'll actually have to Google Dart Lang. Okay. Um, to get to get even the programming language, it just gives you an idea of how new it is, um, and also how hard it is to uh, get Google cred for the word Dart. <laughs> Steal you think it people away. wouldn't think of this before they uh, name their languages? Yeah, yeah. Like the last Google language was Go, and uh, you think even they would have learned? Yeah. <laughs> After Go, you think they would have learned, let's pick something that's not a common word, but uh, but they picked Dart. So. <laughs> so so I guess you let that count of the bag. It's a Google language? That's right. That's right. So it's being worked at uh, by uh, Google engineers. Um, and <clears throat> it's it has a sort of uh, interesting, uh, you know, genesis. So, you know, Dart is a... Let's talk a little bit about Dart. It's a client uh, browser-based... Um, it's meant to be run in a browser, right? Okay. Similar to JavaScript. So uh, basically, Dart tries to kind of get around a lot of the drawbacks, a lot of the weaknesses of JavaScript from an enterprise or a big iron. Wait, JavaScript sort of view. has weakness? I know, shocking. Oh, I'm I think we covered, we did cover JavaScript. So yes, so listen to that episode. Yeah, definitely go back and check that out. And hopefully we'll be consistent, but we're not. <laughs> we're not. We're not checking ourselves. So it's been a while. It has been a while. People have been born since we uh, did the yes. last show. Families have increased in size. <laughs> it's like Agricola. This uh, is like the next turn. I actually made that joke. My wife didn't find it funny. Oh, really? Yes, you have <laughs> take the taken the family growth action. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, but yeah, so one of the biggest things about JavaScript is that. You know, you you can get errors at runtime. It's not statically typed, and it um, doesn't have a lot of the things that many other like languages like Java and C++, languages which have been used in huge applications. It doesn't have a lot of those features, which make it easy for like collaborative development and things like that. Um, so, uh, so Google uh, actually made a product called Google Google Web Toolkit, or GWT for short. And Google Web Toolkit, the idea was you would write code in Java, and then this Google Web Toolkit would turn all of your Java code into JavaScript. And this worked out pretty well, but it has some major issues, and we won't really get into that too much detail. But basically, it doesn't really serve the full use case, and it doesn't have a lot of traction. So um, Dart is an attempt to sort of create a brand new language that is can give you kind of like the flexibility and the rapid prototyping that you need to you know make things quick and make web apps quick. You know web developers are all about you know keeping up to date with the latest UI, making something sleek, making it look really nice, making it interact with the with the HTML, you know, and make it very interactive. Um, and so they uh, didn't they don't want to be constrained with all this statically typing. But then on the other hand, you uh, want to write huge programs that run in the browser. And so Dart is a way to sort of balance both of these. This is an interesting point uh, that when you make a language, everybody thinks they have the right way to make a language, but it's very, very difficult to do everything well. Yep. And so oftentimes you make sacrifices by saying, this is what we're going to do well. And if you don't like that, then find another tool, write your own. Yep. And so I, I guess this is Google stepping up to plate and saying there were some things they didn't like about JavaScript. And so they're going to write their own. 
Yep. Yeah, and so Google Web Toolkit was um, just too much of a departure from the things that made JavaScript great. And uh, so Dart is an attempt to sort of bring those closer together. So <clears throat> as we mentioned, it runs in the browser. Uh, it, right now, there's only a... So let's talk a little bit about virtual machines, right? Okay, yeah, so, we covered that covered that before. But yeah, yeah. Let's, let's do a refresher. Yeah, yeah. So JavaScript runs on the V8 virtual machine, which runs inside of a browser. I thought that runs in a car. Oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah. different, different V8. Oh, see, I knew that. <laughs> it runs in an autonomous car. Yes, ooh. ooh. <laughs> um, so Dart can also run in the browser using its own virtual machine called uh, Dartium, I think, or Dart VM, something like that. Um, but now, you know, to right now, Dart VM only exists in Chrome. Hasn't been ported Which is over. Which made by Google. Right. Surprise! <laughs> yeah. Ding, 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 ding. So it's it's not, uh, you know, there's no Dart VM for Firefox or Internet Explorer or any of those. So you might think, oh, if I write my code in Dart, no one else, you know, who uses, you know, no one outside of Chrome can use it. But that's not true. They wrote a compiler called frog and so what frog does is it takes your dart code and turns it into javascript so you could think of frog is to dart what the google web toolkit is to java so it's sort okay. of a way to translate your code into javascript okay but at the same time if you don't uh want to use frog or you uh or if you're using dart you can actually detect the person's browser and say, oh, this guy's running Chrome, we can give him native Dart code. Uh -huh. Or this person's running Internet Explorer, we'll use Frog and give Ooh. them JavaScript. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So so JavaScript, uh, we, we talked about this before, has the name Java in it, but right. the similarities to Java are... Uh, so what about Dart? How is it similar to Java then? Yeah, yeah, so Dart and Java are extremely similar. So they're both uh, class-based. They both have classes, interfaces, this whole thing. They have inheritance. And I, I believe we cover Java, right? Yeah. Yeah, we definitely covered Java in a previous episode. So uh, definitely go back to that one. But uh, almost everything in Java... Uh, as far as like the architecture of the language and the semantics, um, you'll also find in Dart. Um, one nice thing about Dart is that it also sort of gives you some of the features of JavaScript if you want. So for example, uh, in Dart you can say int x equals 3 and now x has that 3 in it. If you later say x equals Patrick, it'll say an error. It'll say x is an int Aww. and you try to set it to Patrick, that's not going to fly. And so these are the kind of things that you want as a developer. You know, you want it to give you an error up front. You don't want to have to deploy this code and then your customers run it and then they, at runtime they get some weird error because you tried to add Patrick and 10, you know, and, <laughs> and at runtime everything blows up after you've deployed it, right? So Dart has that advantage of you can specify the type. You can say, look, this is a number and it'll always be a number. And if it's ever, you know, if ever something comes in that's a string and I set the number to a string, just tell me right away that something, don't something let it bad's rise. happening. Yeah, don't let this compile. So, um, but it also you can use var. So if you say var x equals three, then you're telling Dart, I want x to be anything. So, uh, so you can turn it off. You can right. turn off the static typing. Yep. And so this lets you be very flexible. So if you really want to hack something up quickly and you want to get out the door, or if you want to be flexible, maybe there really is a variable that could be anything and you want to be able to support that. Uh, maybe some kind of user-generated content or something like that. Um, you know, So Dart will handle that as well. Very nice. Yep. Interesting. Okay. So... Another cool feature of Dart that JavaScript does not have is multi-threading. And Dart actually has two kinds of multi-threading. Because one wasn't enough. <laughs> yeah, that's right. If you'll notice, the big thing about Dart, and maybe we'll talk about this later in the strengths, is that Dart seems to try to do everything. You know, it has, has statically typed, but it can do dynamically typed, and it has many different types of multi-threading. And it has, actually, Dart has all of the Java containers in it, which is something that's really useful. Oh. So yeah, in the case of JavaScript, right, everything is a map. Mm -hmm. So everything is, if you want to say like, you know, day equals three, or if you want to do, you know, day equals Monday, if you want to have some kind of enum, everything has to be structured in a map. But in the case of Dart, you can have lists, you can have sets, you can have maps, all the things that you're used to in Java, 
um, someone's gone in and written and those things in Dart. So it really comes batteries included, as we talked about earlier. So. We like that phrase. Yeah, yeah. It's my, probably my favorite phrase <laughs> of the show. Oh, just of the show. Oh, okay. Yeah, or real life, yeah. Oh, you use that all the time. Yeah, pretty much. Nice. Yeah, family growth option, batteries included. That's pretty much, that's my whole vocabulary. <laughs> oh, oh uh, wow. <laughs> okay. I think we're just going to move on. So you were talking about multi-threading. Yeah, yeah. So Dart has um, coroutines, and it also has full multi-threading. So have we talked about this before? Um, we might have at some level, but we can go over it again. Maybe. How about I'll go over coroutines, and you go over like multi-processing. Okay. All right. So coroutines are having multiple threads in a single process. So you might say to yourself, like, why would I want to do this, right? And the answer is, let's say uh, you were waiting for someone to type a key on the keyboard. But at the same time, you were, um, you know, constantly updating your GUI. Maybe there's some like graphic animation going on in the background. But at the same time, you want someone to be able to type in, or you want someone to click a button to stop the animation, right? So you need to be able to do both of these things at the same time. You don't want to have just one loop that says, you know, run a little bit of the animation and then check to see if Patrick pressed the key and then run a little bit and go back and forth because this makes the code really confusing. Mm -hmm. What you really want is to have two different things running at the same time, one that's waiting for an input and the other that's running the animation. So um, you could do this in multi-processing where you have, you know, two different threads on your operating system that are both doing different things. But this causes a lot of overhead. Anytime you create another process, you have to go to the operating system and say, hey, operating system, I need, you know, I need another space to run to run some executor to execute some code. And it has to go and fetch that for you. And that's a little time consuming. Also, as we mentioned, Dart can be compiled to JavaScript. And JavaScript doesn't support multiprocessing. So you know, there's no way to do that in JavaScript. So <clears throat> Dart has this idea of what's called what Dart calls a light isolate. And this allows you to do coroutines where you have many different threads, but they're all sharing a slice of the same process. So the process basically the process will do sort of what I was describing earlier, where it'll play a little bit of the animation and then listen for a keystroke. But from a code perspective, you're writing code as if you have two things going at the same time. And the multi-threaded is simulated. Hmm. So this is different than multi-processing, which... Yeah, so, so multi-processing, you know, Jason talked about threads sharing a process. And the process is kind of what the operating system deals in. And the operating system schedules processes for the processors to run. And there's overhead there, such as like things that include like the stack. And when you make a thread inside a process, you kind of have to emulate that or eliminate it. And there's all sorts of ways of handling that based on you know what you're trying to accomplish. But multiprocessing in theory allows you, if you have a whole process and you have multiple processors, the operating system can schedule one process to run on one and one process to run on the other and give yourself true multiple things running at the same time versus the CPU just slicing very finely alternating between two different threads. So as a programmer, if the things you're doing aren't particularly intensive, like, you know, draw some animation, you know, check the keyboard, draw some animation, kept, check the keyboard. If neither of those turn out to be, you know, intensive, or in this case, checking the keyboard, most of the time you're just doing nothing, then you can share one process on one processor and it's not a big deal. But if you want to, you know, render the graphics and also compute a path for some entity, if you're doing like, you know, game programming and you want to have AI, those two things are very meaty, uh, intensive things. And if you put them in a, two threads inside of a single process, it makes it harder for the operating system to know what to do. If you put them in two separate processes, the operating system can say, oh, I'll put one on one processor and one on the other. And then they can run at the same time and in theory, make your stuff go twice as fast. Um, yep. There's lots of issues with that simplification, but <laughs> that's what it means at a low level. But sometimes you don't need that. And there's overhead that's incurred from the processor standpoint, switching the process, having all this extra information that the operating store system stores about it and moving those in and out of the processor depending on what's running is something that you can you want to avoid if you don't need it but right. sometimes you need it and it's worth it if it means you can get scheduled on two different processors at the same time yeah totally so um the only other thing i guess i can mention on that is that um the heavy isolates you um don't share any data which you know as patrick mentioned because they're on two different they're two different processes they can run on two different processes yeah, yeah. so um 
the uh, so you have to basically pass messages from one uh, isolate or from the main thread to the isolates versus the light isolates they can actually um, share data because they know that they not... have to be on the same process yeah exactly so and then yeah. oh man we could do a whole whole episode about even I don't, that's not language focused but about the differences and all the different ways that CPUs handle multi-threading and multi-processing yeah, yeah. in different languages and that's something that today is becoming more uh, applicable than ever before because as processors stop getting faster and start getting more cores, yep. this is something that we have to start worrying about. How do we schedule efficiently 32 cores to do something on the on the computer? And it's not always straightforward. Most of the time, is yeah, definitely. We should do if we do Go as a language, we should t do like a whole thing on Go multi. Tries to address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so what are the what are the strengths that Dart? We said it tries to do a lot of things. So, so what are those strengths it really shines in? Yeah, so I think one of the um, you know biggest strengths of Dart is that it gives it gives you the sort of um, what's a good way of describing it. <clears throat> it gives you the sort of structure that you're used to as a like that people have been developing with for years. You know, it's 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 not very often that you see you know a two hundred thousand line JavaScript program, and uh, many JavaScript developers will say that's a good thing. It's because <laughs> we, we can get it done in twenty lines or something. But the reality is, you know, if you have thirty people working on a project. Um, you really want things to be encapsulated. Maybe that's the best word I'm really looking for. So you want to be able to say, look, this is my uh, this is my graphics handler class for my part of this game. And uh, the way you interact with me is you can say like add sprite, remove sprite. So I'm going to give you an interface with some functions, and uh, you can code to this interface. And then, but internally, you know, I'm going to be doing all the handling of the drawing the pixels and things like that. And I'm just going to expose sort of an API. API. That's sort of that's the way a lot of these big languages work. Like C++, you have the header file. And you can give somebody the header file without the source file and they should be able to interact with your code even though they don't know what's happening under the hood. Uh, in the case of Java, you know, they typically use Java docs, right? So you can see a Java doc with the API and you can code to this API, even if you don't know what the code is doing because it's very structured. Um, you know, in the case of JavaScript, this doesn't really exist, right? It's um, JavaScript, everything is uh, an object and there's, it's very hard, you know, you can define an API, but you're doing a lot of the heavy lifting yourself. Um, Dart sort of takes a step back and says, let's give us more of a Java or C++ feel to browser-based, to client-side browser computing. And that's something that, especially if you go to working with large teams of people, is something that is really beneficial. It also seems nice that it has the option for the static typing or the dynamic typing. So if you really yeah. want dynamic typing and you're in Dart, great, use it. But if you have that static typing to enable those compile time checks and make sure you didn't just try to put a string in an integer or vice versa or try to add three to a to a string, which doesn't make a lot of sense or is ambiguous, that it's really nice to be able to have that because it enables, again, if Jason wrote one piece of line of code and I wrote another and I thought he was using a string, in reality he was using an integer, then you know it, it could be a problem. And so it's nice to be able to kind of have those enforcements and checks there if you want them. Yep. Yeah, I mean, just to put an example, I mean, let's say, you know, I was writing this graphics engine and Patrick was using it as part of his game. Um, you know, in the case of JavaScript, I just create a set of functions, but I don't really say, oh, you know, you have to pass in two integers and a string or something like that. And in fact, in JavaScript, I believe you can pass the wrong number of arguments and it'll just put in nuns, you know, for the other ones. So if I go in and change my API, um, Patrick might not know. Uh, he definitely won't know at compile time because there's no compiler. JavaScript's completely interpreted, right? But even at runtime, it could be just really, like the code can just do really strange things that you're not sure of if someone, um, you know, changes an implementation of something. But with Dart, it sort of allows you to, you know, to, to create these modules. And so it allows two people to sort of work together uh, in parallel without having to constantly stay in sync. So we already talked about a little, but some of the weaknesses is that the frog compiler isn't an efficient generator of JavaScript code. Doesn't you yeah. could do better by hand, you know, writing yeah, your own JavaScript. 
And that tends to be, with any transition, tends to be the first thing that happens is people go, oh, I could write this better myself. And it's like, well, yeah, but that's not the point. Yeah, I think at, at some point someone was telling me, I think when I was in like middle school or something, like, oh, we could do this so much better in assembly, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's always true, but at the end it comes down to, are you going to pay the price in your, you know, how much time you have to invest or in how fast it's going to run? So, so we always try to give some uses of Dart. And I, I think that's especially difficult because it's pretty early early on i mean darts yep. darts relatively new what a year less than a year now yeah i don't and, even know and so um oh, oh we failed to do a little bit of research but that's okay <laughs> and so it's still pretty experimental and you know nobody kind of really knows what google's intentions are per se with dart and where they're trying to go with it and so um people are, are playing around with it we'll see you know what kind of happens but you know maybe we do this this is a little bit earlier in the life cycle of a language than we've done before but it's something interesting but uh jason you did find one one kind of cool use one app that was using Dart. Yeah, it looks like some guys got together and made this thing called Dartendo. Dartendo. Yeah, which uh, we'll give a link on the on the show notes. But uh, it's dartendo.appspot.com, and it looks like it's a complete Nintendo emulator written in Dart. So wait, so a Nintendo emulator in my browser? Yeah, it's kind of wild, and these guys made a made a drew a little TV graphic around it to make it look like it's uh, make it feel more Retro. homely. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's it completely runs uh, the NES, and it looks like you can load drag and drop ROMs into it oh, and stuff so, like that. So you have to upload your own that that you've legally obtained by yeah. soldering you know memory readers onto your Nintendo cartridges and That's right. getting the code from. Yes, so, I, I have many such uh, cartridges. That I've done this too. Yeah. So for everybody out there who uh who has desoldered their nintendo cartridges that they purchased with their hard-earned money and uh put the roms on their on their computer um uh, they could do that otherwise it runs a uh little nintendo test suite which uh that by itself is kind of interesting you can see okay. how the nintendo self tests so this has got audio video controls yep. yeah it seems to have the whole shebang interesting um, all right well people can check that out we'll yeah it's actually it, so. it's actually open source and it looks Looks like it's pretty hefty amount of Dart code, so... Okay, so it's always good to be able to look at an application written in a language and kind of get a feel for how people do things or what's being done, so that's definitely useful. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, man, well, you got anything else? It's been a long time, but it feels good to be back in the, uh, not in the driver's seat, in the uh, podcasting seat. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah, it feels good to be doing this again. Um, we appreciate all the comments. You know, a lot of people were kind of saying, hey, you know, when's the next We were episode? missed. It's and, nice to be missed. Yeah, it's really nice to be missed, definitely. So it's uh, a lot of fun doing this. We're definitely going to keep it going now that uh, Christmas season has ended and we're both back in uh, uh, back in our hometown, or back, not in our hometown, but... Uh, Back our to our landing, place of residence. Yeah, our landing pad. <laughs> I don't know what the right word is, but now that we're not traveling all over the place, so uh, it's kind of nice to, uh, to to be back doing this. So. Awesome. Well, until next time. Yeah, have fun hacking with your Raspberry Pi or Arduino or whatever. If you other. can manage to buy one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you, if you can get on the waiting list quick enough. So, all right, see you next time. See you later. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.